right, well, you may be seated, man. Thank you for being here today. Again, if you're a guest with us, my name is David Whitten, and I have the great honor of being the senior pastor here. And if you'd take that little red and white connect card, we'd love to get some contact information from you. I promise you, nobody's going to show up on your doorstep this afternoon unless you invite us to, but we just want to put a little note in the mail of thanks uh, in expressing our appreciation for you joining us on this very special day where we have one combined service that we call Love the Hub. But before we get ready to go out and scatter throughout this city to serve, I want you to grab your Bible if you have it or open up a smartphone, your, your Bible app, and I want you to turn to, to Matthew chapter 22, the New Testament gospel of Matthew chapter 22, because before we scatter out to serve this community in all kinds of practical ways, we first want to wrap up our current Christianese series by looking at one final word or kind of digging into and explaining one final topic, which is this one, and it's worship. It's worship. That as you can see on the screen, over the last 11 weeks, these are the churchy words that we have been talking about, that we have been defining. These are the words that we as Christ followers have a tendency to say or use or talk about that make a whole lot of sense to us, but can be a bit confusing to, to other people. And while last Sunday, Pastor Drew Chapman did an amazing job in talking about and explaining and digging into that word witness and, and what that really means from a biblical standpoint, this morning, I hope to do the same with this concept and this idea of worship, because contrary to what a whole lot of people may want to think or believe, worship and our worship of God is way more than just singing, and our worship of God is way more than something that happens in the 70 minutes that we gather together in here on any given Sunday. Now, don't get me wrong, our worship, man, it can include singing, and worship can, in fact, take place in a service like this, but, but as we're about to see, worship is way more than just singing, and worship is way more than something that happens one day a week for the 70 minutes that we gather together on a Sunday morning. In church, we know that's true because of something that Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 22. So if you have your Bible, open it up, Matthew chapter 22, and I want us to start reading in verse number 36. Matthew's gospel begins this way. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now let's pause for just a moment because here in Matthew chapter 22, we have what's commonly referred to as the great commandment. And the reason that it's called the great commandment is because at this point in the life and the ministry of Jesus, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they have kind of gathered together. They're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trap Jesus because if they can catch him doing something wrong, if they can catch him saying or teaching something that's wrong, then, then they have an excuse to arrest him and throw him in prison and try to end his earthly ministry that, that he had just started. And, and so they asked Jesus this question, all right, Jesus, you, you, you seem to, to know it all and you say that you're God in the flesh. So tell us, hey, O oh wise one, what is the greatest commandment in all the law and all the prophets? Now, keep in mind that in their worldview, they weren't just like 10 commandments like we think of in the Old Testament. And in their mind, in their worldview, there was actually 613 commandments. They had 248 things that you had to do. And then there was 365 things that you could never do. And in, and in response to this question, they asked Jesus about which of these commandments and which of these laws is the greatest. Jesus answers that question by saying this, starting in verse 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord, your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All right, so for those who may not know, not only does my personal philosophy of ministry and 
our church tagline of love God, love people, and serve both. Not only does it come from the passage of scripture that we just read, but then so too does my personal definition of worship. Because here in verse 37, when Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, that was a statement about a person's priorities and that was a statement about a person's focus. And according to Jesus Christ himself, when a person's main priority is to bring glory and honor to God, and when a person's focus is all about the Son of God and, 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 and worshiping him, then listen, then everything we do, no matter when we may do it, it becomes an opportunity for us to worship God. That when our mind is focused on Jesus and when our heart is one that says, I want to honor him in this moment, then everything we do becomes an opportunity to worship, which is why notice on the screen, my favorite definition of worship is this one. Worship is when my mind's attention and my heart's affection is on God. Let's say that out loud, shall we? Worship is when my mind's attention and my heart's affection is on God. That's my favorite definition of worship. And again, the reason I love this definition of worship because it reminds us that, that everything we do, that, that every single one of the 10,080 minutes that make up any given week, that every single one of those moments is in fact an opportunity to worship and bring glory and honor to God. Every single one of them. That as long as our mind in that moment is focused on Jesus, and as long as the desire of our heart in that moment is I want to give Jesus my best in this moment, that is biblical worship. So what that means is this, that, that, that whether it's my singing, whether it's my serving, whether it's my giving, whether it's my praying, whether it's my sharing, no matter what it is, the Bible says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, as long as you and I do it for the glory of God, that is worship, which means that you and I can worship God at any time and in anything we do. Why, yes, it may include singing, and why, yes, our worship may take place, and while we might worship in a service such as this one, listen, worship doesn't always include singing, and it certainly doesn't include a service like this one. It's simply a person or a group of people who, in whatever they're doing in any given moment of any given day, says, my mind's attention right now is focused on God, my heart is to give him my very best. And when you and I have a mind's attention and our heart's affection is on God, that becomes worship. An opportunity to lift up and to celebrate and to bring glory and honor to God. Now, let me illustrate it to you this way, using this, this, this wagon wheel for just a moment, all right? So, so let's say that this wagon wheel, for the sake of illustration, that, that this wagon wheel represents my life and your life. And what a whole lot of people do, including a whole lot of well-meaning Christian people, is that we put ourselves at the center of our life, that we are the focus of our life, and life revolves around us. And and when we put ourselves at the center of our life, then our worship of Jesus and our worship of God and, 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 and our singing or whatever, it becomes one thing that we do among many. So we go to work, we go to school, we have friends, we have hobbies, we have uh, different things we're involved in. We have all these other aspects of our life. And when we are put at the center of our life, worship and our worship of Jesus and God, it's just one thing we do among many. And rarely, if ever, does our worship of Jesus spill over and affect all these different areas of our life. Rarely does it happen that we come to church and for the 70 minutes we're in here, or maybe for the hour and a half we're on Wednesday nights and uh, we're gathered together for class and teaching and equipping and that kind of stuff. Like, like, like this is Jesus. This is the part of our life that we give to God. And then everything else is separate. And rarely does Jesus and our worship of Jesus affect any of these other areas. It's separate, total. It's completely different. And so in this scenario, when we're at the center of our life, we go to work and guess what? It's just work. Man, we go to school and guess what? It's just school. 
Man, we get involved in our extracurricular hobbies and activities or after school sports, or whatever. And hey, it's just something we do after school. We, we have our, our finances. We have our family life. We have our, our work life. We have our voting life. We're going to talk about that next Sunday. Like, like we have all these different aspects of our life. And rarely, if ever, does Jesus and our worship of Jesus, does he have any effect or influence on any of these other areas? Worship is just something we do. When I come to church and I sing, that's worship. When I walk through those doors, that's worship. But when I walk out those doors, I leave my worship behind. I leave my faith behind. I leave my Jesus behind. And rarely, if ever, does Jesus affect these other areas. But what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22 in the great commandment, Jesus says that our mindset should be just the opposite. That Jesus says, man, we need to put him at the center of our life that he becomes the focus of our life. And we worship the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your, your mind. And so we put our mind's attention and our heart's affection upon God. And when we put our mind's attention and our heart's affection upon God, then watch this, then Jesus and our worship of God affects and is a part of every single aspect of our life. He's not something different. He's not something completely separate. Man, he is a part of, and our worship of Jesus as a direct influence on every single aspect of our life. It may include singing. It may include gathering together. But listen, sometimes it has nothing to do with singing, has nothing to do with gathering. It has everything we do with putting our mind's attention and our heart's affection upon him, and having a desire that says, in this moment, no matter what I'm doing, in this moment, no matter what I'm doing, my desire is to give God my best. And so again, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, man, do it all for the glory of God. Why? Because that makes everything we do an opportunity to worship. It says in Colossians chapter three and 17, in whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, so whatever is whatever, right? We move on, we see this. Colossians chapter three, we move on in the slides. It says, whatever you do. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So guess what? When you go to your job tomorrow, when you go to your job, man, you're working not for a company, not for a business, not for a man, not for a woman, not even for yourself. Man, you're working with all your heart for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And then my favorite, Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Why? This is your spiritual act of worship. And while we could go on and on, the, 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 the key takeaway today is this, that our mindset as a Christ follower should never be, this is my life and worship is just something that I do. Our mindset should be that Jesus is the focus of my life, that Jesus is the center of my life. And because of that, he is a part of and he affects every single thing that I do. And so when I work, I'm working for the Lord. When I'm at school, I'm schooling for the Lord. When I'm playing ball or practicing, man, I'm playing ball and I'm practicing for the Lord. When I'm hanging out with my friends, man, I'm hanging out with my friends and I'm trying to bring glory and honor to God in that moment when, I, when I'm fishing or hunting or whatever, man, I, I'm trying to, 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 to worship, to, to focus on God and to celebrate who he is and what he's done and his blessings. Like, like he becomes a part of everything that we do. And when we put him at the center of our life and we put our mind's attention and our heart's affection upon him, everything is affected Jesus becomes a part of everything that we do, which means that everything we do becomes an opportunity to worship, including going out in this community and serving people on Love the Hub Day. Now, speaking of Love the Hub, again, before we scatter throughout this city to serve our community in practical ways, which again, can in fact be an opportunity to worship, because remember, 
If you don't take away anything other today, take, take this away. Remember, the reason why serving can be an act of worship is because our worship of God doesn't begin when we walk through those doors and it certainly doesn't end just because we walk out of them. Everything is an opportunity to worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with this, all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Mind's attention, heart's affection, that's worship. But before we go worship God by serving, I want us to take a moment today as we're all gathered together in one service to remind ourselves and to celebrate the greatest act of service that's ever been done, which was Jesus laying down his sinless body and Jesus shedding his perfect and sinless blood so that we could be forgiven of our sin, have a relationship with our heavenly father and receive eternal life. And so if you're in the room or watching online and there's already been a time in your life where you've confessed to Christ that you're a sinner in need of a savior and you put your faith and trust in God and you're trusting in Christ and Christ alone for salvation and heaven and eternal life, then, then during these next few moments that we call our response time, maybe you just wanna take some time to steal your heart and to, and, and, and to say thank you to Jesus for, for saving you and for blessing you and for being good to you. Say thank you to Jesus for how he sustained you through difficult times, for how he has blessed you in big ways and small. Like if you already know Jesus as your savior, then, then use this response time as an opportunity to just kind of get your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God because even taking communion is an opportunity to worship. So if you know Christ, then take advantage of these next few moments that are coming up just to, to focus on him and to say thank you. If you're in the room or you're watching online and there's never been a time in your life where you put your faith and trust in Jesus, where you've repented of your sin and you kind of crossed that line of faith and said, I'm all in with Jesus, then use this response time to come forward and talk to myself or another staff person or one of our prayer partners. If you're online, you can type in a question that you want to talk to somebody. Like, like no matter your environment or where you are today, if there's someone in the room or online and you've never repented of your sin and accepted Christ to be your savior, then take advantage of these moments in the response time to do just that. And then for all of us, let's just make a commitment for the next seven days that, that instead of making life all about us, let's make the next seven days all about Jesus. And let's make it a goal that every single day we're gonna try our best, right? Because it's 10,080 minutes in a week. We typically reduce worship to the 70 or so that we're gathered in here. And then we leave the other 10,010, just whatever. Let's make a commitment today that we're gonna give all 10,080 minutes to the Lord and let's seek to worship him and give him our best in all those different moments and make him a part of everything that we do. Why? Because we learn that worship is when my mind's attention and my heart's affection is on God. And can you imagine the difference we can make for the kingdom of God and in the lives of other people in this community? If you and I as Christ followers, imagine the difference we can make if work just wouldn't work, but it was an opportunity to worship and bring glory and honor to God. Like what if school wasn't just school, but it was an opportunity to worship and bring glory and honor to God? What if ball wasn't just ball, but it was an opportunity to worship and bring glory and honor to God? What if, what if how we manage our finances and our marriage and how we raise our kids? Like, like imagine what would happen if the world saw all of these people in red shirts for the next seven days, making Jesus a part of everything we do, everywhere we go. And imagine what would happen if we made everything an opportunity to worship, to focus and to bring glory and honor to him and allow Jesus to become the center of our life and everything we're involved in. Folks, it's bigger than just 70 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's bigger than just gathering together inside these four walls. Man, there is a whole nother aspect of our life that Jesus wants us to worship him in and through and give him our best. And imagine the difference we can make if we made that commitment today. So I'm gonna pray, and as I'm praying, after I'm done, if you wanna come pray by yourself, that's fine. If you, uh, if you want somebody to pray with you or for you, man, we're gonna be down front and we're gonna have uh, an opportunity for, for that to happen. If you're online, if you want somebody to pray for you, you can type it in and, and, and we can pray for you through technology. It's, it's brilliant. 
But in these next few moments, let's focus in our hearts. Let's repent of any sins that we need to repent of. Let's make sure we're taking the elements of the Lord's Supper in a manner that is worthy of the body and the blood of Jesus. And then after that, we're gonna scatter and we're gonna worship God by serving our city in all kinds of practical ways. As I'm praying, the men who are passing out the elements, if you will go to your stations, and then once we're done with the response time, I'll come back up and give you the instruction to start passing those out, all right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. God, we thank you for the chance to gather together as the family here at Temple Baptist Church. And God, we thank you that you give us clarity in the scripture of what is the greatest thing that you want us as Christ followers to be about. And it's to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And so today, help us to make a commitment to do that, to put you at the center of our life, to make you a part of everything that we do, knowing that when we do that, then we can worship you through everything and in everything. And today, as we take these elements, may we just say thank you and express our gratitude to you, our Savior, for shedding your sinless blood, for laying down your sinless body so that we could be forgiven, so that we could serve, so that we can worship. God, we thank you for who you are and for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 